Ben van Berkel, where are you? Welcome to the stage. How are you? Very uh, well. We, um, we've known each other for quite some time. And um, I uh, made for all of the speakers a little briefing. It was actually just one sentence. Do you remember what I wrote you? Uh, uh, maybe, maybe not fully. <laughs> but it, the, the, what I wrote, Ben, was uh, why don't you talk about how you uh, shape your buildings with light? and how light uh, is shaped by your buildings. And Ben replied and he said, no, 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 I want to talk about how I frame my buildings with light and how light <laughs> is framed by my buildings. And I found that so profoundly beautiful um, that I just cannot wait for your talk. So I hand you the clicker and Thank um, you. enjoy the time here Thank at you. the Year of Light. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let's start with the first image, uh, framing the light. Yes, how do we do that? Um, uh, in a way, of course, with architecture, you could say, as, as I'm an architect, but, but on the other hand, today, it is not so easy to frame the light. As you know, that light becomes today, as, as we heard also earlier on, becomes data. Um, through the uh, LED uh, uh, ideas, uh, through the way how we now work with, with our light computers, you could say, uh, the phones, you can see it here on this map that today with the connections of the way how we communicate, light goes maybe beyond the, the idea of framing. So I thought maybe today to talk about what light can do to us through knowledge, through data and how we can translate that potentially into an architecture that goes beyond the classical notion of maybe how we looked at architecture through the idea of the frame. So with light we can create communities, we can create a common ground, we can communicate about the way how we'd like to enjoy uh, the world of light. Like this artwork of Piet uh, Lotte Riest, um, you know her, she's a wonderful artist, she exhibited some of her works already in several museums and places here in Holland. Um, and as I talked with her, as I know her so well, uh, about the way how we could maybe paint with light. She responded that that was for her always been the case that she painted with a camera and for that reason she makes these highly dynamic uh, digital light pieces where you feel so comfortable with and as you can see people enjoy to be there with her artworks. And maybe in a similar way I'd like to try and it's difficult to paint with architecture as if you can paint with spaces and as you can see here frame the different uh, qualities of light coming towards you as you maybe calm down in the place where you'd like to rest and maybe uh, sleep or, or or maybe like to retreat and then come to the space like in this house which we did uh, in upstate New York where you come to the middle part of the house where people of the family meet and come together where all the light is centered not through artificial light, but also through the daylight. But if you stand outside the house, then of course the house is also uh, playing with that idea of the light and how it is framed in, an, in, in a maybe unusual way because it's also reflected. And, and it creates a quality of making the light like as it is creating after images, as if it is giving you double readings that it gives you new ideas of the way how you can look not only to architecture but also through the architecture uh, to the landscape again. So it gives you new thought models of the way how light can be seen in, in many more directions than only uh, uh, seeing it as the way how it can guide a form. Uh, it is it's almost as in the self-portrait of Lucian Freud where the light is coming from almost seven or eight different directions and whereas the character of the face and the social codes of the character are expressed in so many uh, beautiful ways in the in, in the in the painting and similarly I hope with the way how we can uh, direct the light and, and guide it and orient it that we can uh, give uh, here a kind of self-portrait of the owner's house uh, when you are in the house or when you move around the house actually the owner is a uh, Russian uh, uh, friend, um, quite uh, interested in gold, um, and I just wanted to play uh, with that. Uh, that uh, f f maybe a bit funny uh, interest, um, but but more and more in the latest work. This is a house we recently finished in uh, in Holland, 
uh, I cannot fully show it yet because it's going to be published fully uh, in a week time, but I'd like to give you a glimpse of where we go then further with this idea of the deep uh, tissue or the deep surface of the way how you can bring more, more action towards uh, the way how, how light is here coming together in many ways in this uh, uh, house. But, but in the early 2000s, um, when we were asked, and actually Rogier, uh, that was in the beginning of his uh, career, I think almost, when he started to work uh, with, with light uh, uh, um, in, in uh, many respects to the relationship to architecture, um, here we uh, uh, discussed with the client the way how um, different ways of um, uh, uh, using advertisement on the facade where we said, I mean, would you really be interested to do that in this case? Would you not try to find a common ground of the way how this facade can be littered? And, and we came up with a kind of pointillist approach towards the facade, as you can see here. Um, and you have to really uh, think of that this, in the beginning of 2000, was one of the first uh, LED littered um, facades in this scale what could be actually changing constantly in color uh, and by that uh, um, creating a totally new landmark within the city. And, and the moment when we had finished the project, it became so popular that people started to talk about the lamp of the city and that they would meet at the lamp of the city. Um, so, so through, let's say, the painting of light and, and facade uh, services here and, and, and in Howard, with that also creates a different color effect. It's something what I tested over the years constantly in the way how it could direct and orient uh, spatial and maybe social organizational uh, principles. Um, like how would it be possible, for instance, with a foil I introduce here in the glass, where the light coming towards the glass generates in each corner you stand and each part of the day a different effect on the uh, common uh, part here of this uh, building. So it creates almost nine different colors, this facade, where you walk around it and it changes the colors while you are uh, getting different types of light coming towards uh, this building. And with that, it creates also different shadows, colors, color shadows. And, and we marked these shadows, as you can see in the part here. And for that reason, uh, uh, the people who work in this building talk now about when ever it is lunchtime, that is yellow time. They say it's yellow time, so let's go for lunch. Uh, or it's red time, so we could have a, a tea break. So, so color and, and light and time came all together in this whole structure of the way how people enjoy this internal uh, space of this building, as if every day the sun shines. But it, came, it gave me more ideas about the way how uh, light could uh, direct people in buildings and, and with that activate uh, a social sustainable principle of the way how that might be maybe important in office buildings for instance or many other buildings where knowledge is exchanged within uh, the way how the work environment is organized for instance and um, lately I call it active design uh, and, and in an office building like this it's a project we did for the uh, Frauenhof Institute in uh, Stuttgart, we uh, generated an idea that you can't use an elevator. Uh, elevators are a little bit hidden in the building. Everyone needs to walk. Everyone meets in the central corridor through the way how the light is organized in the central part of the building. And, and through this, people meet more and exchange much more knowledge. And the office environments are not there to be found anymore. Uh, they're more laboratorium-like spaces. And this became, for that reason, one of the most important new prototypes of an office building, uh, you can visit uh, what goes beyond the classical office spaces as we know today. And we know office buildings are, you know, in a way not necessary. We have so many million square meters of uh, empty office spaces in Holland right now. And similarly, we apply this to its uh, uh, university projects, like this is a campus project we are finishing in a few months in Singapore for uh, the Department of Engineering and Architecture, where students can in a quite compact space, constantly uh, exchange knowledge with each other, see each other, and where there is no hierarchy anymore between 
um, the professors and the students. In a way, the students are more uh, organizing the professors in this uh, building through a new type of network, through their phones, through the way how they'd like to work together in a team on a topic. And, and uh, in the evening, when the light is a little bit more uh, uh, reduced in the building because of energy savings, uh, the spaces are more compartmentalized and used in a smaller part of the building in order to, yeah, like I said, save energy. But, but one of the last projects I'd like to show you where time and space and the energy of light came together in a uh, project uh, we did also in Stuttgart. It's the Mercedes-Benz Museum. As if, if you walk around in this building, it's almost as if the space is following you. And, and the ideas came here together with the idea of how could it be possible to create a time machine with light. And, and not only with artificial light, but also with daylight. And was it for us then, maybe here, the possible um, possible to find a way to introduce a strategy whereby the light could almost follow you in the time machine when you are in this building. And by this uh, idea of the central void space, what could be totally open, where light comes through uh, the central part of the building uh, into the uh, void space, but also as you can see on the side, the daylight comes slowly in so that you can follow always the light in this building. Uh, this was done through a new device whereby we could use a, a new smoke detector system, as you can see in this tornado here. Um, and this tornado is used only when there is a fire in the building. But this is a totally new idea, uh, not invented by myself, but by all my specialists who worked with me on this idea, so that we could have a total open uh, building where all this light could come across in a kaleidoscopic way uh, through the central part of the building. Um, so, I'm, and these ideas, these new technologies uh, are necessary to create the opportunities and the possibilities to introduce these, these ideas of the way how one can work with light. Uh, there is no compartmentalization going on in the building. We could reduce down almost 30% of the cost and the materials in the building. We could actually uh, use with that concrete core activation, as it is called right now, whereby you can heat up the concrete for only three hours in the day. And by that you can, um, these three hours, you can then heat up the rest of the day, the building for, for uh, uh, um, that small amount of energy you use for the building. Um, you know all the helicopter hanging above in the uh, Museum of Modern Art? Uh, this client was not interested to do a, sh an, a museum, but we convinced the client to do a museum in order to bring more people to the building, in order to enjoy it, the idea of that an like the helicopter, the car could become an industrial art product. And many people come to this building to enjoy the daylight and the nightlight whenever they are in Stuttgart. But the last slide I would like to show you is of the Erasmus Bridge, because it is in this building. Um, the Erasmus Bridge was for me one of the key uh, projects uh, when I designed it in uh, the mid-90s, what plays with the idea of light, because of its light blue color. Maybe some of you remember that that my mother, at least, uh, she used uh, light blue in the wash of the white wash in order to make it whiter than white. And, and she believed that it was possible to do that with this light blue color, a uh, kind of baby blue color, in order to make the white whiter. And I experimented that endlessly over ma so many years to find out if that was really uh, true. But then I discovered that light blue is no color because it absorbs all the other colors. As what you can see with the Erasmus Bridge. It is a light blue, but it always absorbs so many colors. And the reason is, why we did this, is simply because the bridge is having so many phases, it's so many, having so many histories of the city, the robustness of the city, the way how it brings the north and the south of Rotterdam together, how it is related to the industrial history of Rotterdam, and it's, and it's fantastic, uh, uh, renewal of the city after the war and and this idea of the lightness of the bridge and, and the way how it can be perceived in so many ways with so many after images and how it can bring so many people together and how it then became such an important symbol I could never predict even when you are there in the night because then you ca cannot see the bridge you cannot fully experience the bridge uh, from a distance because it's only littered from the inside out only there where you go over the bridge it's as if you always want to come back to it. Thank you very much.